I'd like to speak this morning on the topic of post-doom inspiration. There's a bringing together of weird words, isn't it? Post-doom inspiration. Finding joy in contracting and collapsing times, or as the title in your bulletin, post-doom inspiration, honoring grief, empowering action. And I want to speak in sort of three, I mean, every sermon is supposed to have three points or three themes, right? So, so first I want to talk about getting to doom. What does that mean? Honoring the stages of grief is what it primarily means. So getting to doom, honoring the stages of grief. Then I'd like to speak about a post-doom mind and a post-doom heart. What is the thinking and the spiritual practices that can allow us to be in a truly post-doom place. I'll describe what that means in a minute. And then finally, I'll conclude in terms of post-doom living. What does it mean to live in a post-doom way that is fearlessly with love and compassion being that which drives our activism rather than fear and freak out? So, first, what does it mean to get to a post-doom place? What, how do you get to doom in the first place? Well, I see, let me define my terms. So, doom is the midpoint between denial and regeneration, with or without us. Earth will regenerate. Even if we go extinct soon, Earth will regenerate. That's what life does. It's the fundamental nature of nature. When I speak in Christian churches, I say doom is the midpoint between denial and resurrection because that's what resurrection means mythically. It means regeneration. It's compost. It's not just about one God-man 2,000 years ago. It's about the nature of reality, that out of death comes new life, out of breakdown and chaos bring forth new possibilities. Now, we recognize that nothing lasts forever. In fact, there are, there, well, let me finish defining my term. So doom is the midpoint between denial and regeneration. The reason that we avoid even feeling doom or even thinking about it is because we think it's the end point. We think that we're going to be in despair the rest of our lives if we allow ourselves to feel doom. And by doom, all I mean is this. The emotional state that most people feel when they have to get rid of or let go of, let's just say let go of, when they have to let go of the secular religion of perpetual progress. When you finally get in your gut that humans and human history isn't all about a one-way trip to technological nirvana and utopia, when you get that, in fact, we know of a hundred and plus civilizations that have become great and collapsed, and we know a lot about the dynamics of contraction and collapse, and we're 30 to 40 years into that process in the United States, then doom is the emotional place that most of us go to when we realize that we don't have, let's put it this way, we have more of a likelihood of going extinct than we have of living on Mars. Elon Musk is out of touch with reality. So, that doesn't feel very good, and most of us have to go through the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. We deny it. Now, I imagine there's probably few denialists, full-blown denialists here, but there's such a thing as functional denial, which is actually a normal, healthy thing. Functional denial is, all right, you get climate chaos, you get that we could go extinct in the next 100 years, but there's nothing we can do about it, or very little we can do about it, and so you don't want to dwell on it on a day-by-day -day basis, and you don't want to fear for your kids and grandkids, so you just don't think about it. That's healthy, that's normal, that's natural. And if you're a real climate activist, and you're passionate, and some of your friends and family are in a functional denial place, just love them exactly as they are and exactly as they're not and stop trying to guilt them into making, getting to where you are intellectually. So, the midpoint, stages of grief, denial, anger. Who of us hasn't felt anger towards the multinational corporations and fossil fuel industry and big agriculture and pharmaceutical? I mean, there's a lot that we can re be very justifiably angry about. And so that's a normal part of the process until you realize, stepping back and looking at whole, the whole of human history, 
that actually it turns out that unsustainable civilizations, of which we know about over a hundred of them in the last 7,000 years, they're all human-centered. They're all anthropocentric. It's all about us, rather than all about life. Turns out what all sustainable cultures, which is for the first 97 to 99% of human history, we lived in a pro-future way, that we lived in a way in the present that was a blessing to the seventh generation. Turns out that acting in the present with the seventh generation in mind isn't just a good idea. To do otherwise is evil. But we are inheritors of systems of governance, of religion, of politics, of economics that are hundreds, in some cases, thousands of years of human centeredness. So religion has not been able to do the only thing that religion can do in sustainable, healthy cultures, which is ensure accountability to the future. That's the role of, it's called life ways in indigenous cultures and in African cultures prior to slavery, and still in some places, it's life ways. And your life ways, the, the, the moral voice of society that ensured that the future was never compromised by the present can only occur within the religious or life ways context. No other structure or institution in society can speak with that kind of moral authority. So religion has been asleep at the wheel for hundreds and hundreds of years. Actually, it's, it's really worse than that. Religion isn't just asleep at the wheel. Half of religion is gagged and tied in the trunk. And the other half of religion are in the back seat cheering on the psychopathic politicians that are driving us over the cliff. This is crazy. So when you awaken to the fact that perpetual progress isn't what the future entails, it feels like ugh, doom, despair, gloom, right? And so that keeps us from feeling that. And yet Joanna Macy reminds us again and again that the measure of your grief is the measure of your love. You would not be experiencing grief if you didn't love. So the anger, the frustration, the grief that we feel has us recognize how profoundly interrelated and interconnected we are. We are stardust become conscious of itself. We are part of the living world. We're not separate from nature. And then of course, bargaining, another one of the stages of grief. You know, if we all just get solar power, if we all become vegan, if we all stop flying, if we all this, if we all that, and all those are good things. But none of them are gonna allow wasteful, human-centered industrialism to continue. Homo colossus will go extinct. It's inevitable, it's necessary. That doesn't necessarily mean homo sapiens, but it does mean homo colossus, where each industrial human lives in a way that uses 20 to 50 times the resources and exudes 20 to 50 times the waste. That has no future. So renewables, the only possible future is renewable energy, but it can't allow this kind of wasteful industrialism to continue. So that's the bargaining. And then of course, there's the depression, which many of us who have been paying attention to climate and other large scale issues deal with. And then finally, the acceptance of accepting that perpetual progress is a myth. It's not the future. And our kids are gonna have it more and more challenging. Not, it's, it's, we're, living, we're living in a classic pattern of an unsustainable civilization, which it typically takes twice as long to become great as it does to collapse. It typically takes one or two centuries to collapse and two to four centuries to become great. That's the normal pattern. And we know a lot about the decline. And it turns out that in expanding con uh, economies, in expanding where there's carrying capacity, that's the ecological term, carrying capacity surplus. There's more than enough energy, more than enough material resources, more than enough land. And times are good. And if you're born and you die in those kind of expanding times, progress isn't a belief, it's a fact. Things got better, things got easier, things got wealthier. And you've got Steven Pinker and many of the other prophets of progress that are saying things are continuing to get better. Well, yeah, only if you don't focus on what every system humans depend upon. The air, the water, the soil, the life, the climate, other species, everything is not just in decline, it's in precipitous freefall. And that's depressing. So that's, again, 
that place. But then the paradox is when we allow ourselves to feel the grief. See, what avoided, what, what kept us from going through the middle, the post-doom door, is on top, we, first of all, we saw doom, and then on top of it, we saw W-A-S-F. And of course, we all knew what that meant. We are so, hmm, right? But the paradox is when we go through that post-doom doorway and look back, and look forward, we realize, A, it's the midpoint, it's not the end. And we can have these spheres of gratitude for the fact that we are conscious and we get to participate in a pro-future way. We get to help redeem our species even if we go extinct in the next 100 years. We get to play a redemptive role. We get to come home. I call it the prodigal species. Humanity. We squandered our inheritance. We're waking up to our predicament in the pig pen, as it were, and we're coming home to reality. Whether you mythologize reality as God or the goddess or you just use life, we're coming home to life, coming back home. So that's the prodigal species. So these spheres of gratitude, and then you have fearless action because you're not trying to save industrialism because you realize that's not possible. Part of sanity you know that old 12-step prayer, God, life, reality? Let's just use life. Life, personal relationship to life. That's what all tribal peoples had. All indigenous peoples everywhere in every culture had an I-thou personal relationship to what we would call in secular language the biosphere or the ecosphere. So having that personal relationship to life allows us that a new frame on the prayer, the 12-step prayer, which is, Life, grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. In other words, accepting what's inevitable is a vital part of our sanity. It's a vital part of that which wakes us up each day excited to be alive rather than focusing on all the things we're losing. Because it's very easy to stay really depressed. There's no shortage of political insanity. Need I say more? There's no shortage of economic insanity, need I say more? There's no shortage of ecological cluelessness. I mean, I could go on and on, I'm not gonna do that. My point is that we can focus on everything that's being lost and we can stay in despair every day. It's pretty easy to do. Or we can focus on where our hearts lead us to be a blessing at the scale and locations that we can be a blessing. It's almost always local. It's, always, it's almost always related to our relationship to the living world. Planting trees. Planting trees is holy work. Connie, my wife, is all about helping, a, helping native trees to migrate north faster than, than climate. Because see, it turns out, other, for millions of years, trees, native trees, have gone north and south with the glaciers. Every time the glaciers came south, all the trees and plants went south. When the glaciers went back, they came back. But now climate change is happening so rapidly that thousands of species of plants and trees, native plants, native trees, will go extinct in the next 50 to 100 years unless humans assist them in migrating faster than any other animal can move them. So even if we go extinct in the next 100 years, taking seeds of your favorite plant from further south, you can actually do this, it's legal. Further south, it's not the same as cross continent, you can't do that, but take seeds and then plant them further north. You're helping trees migrate faster than squirrels or any other animals. Connie's been doing this with redwoods, coast redwoods. So if you're interested in that, talk to Connie afterwards. But building topsoil is holy work. Anything that we do that's a blessing to the larger body of life. I mean, you all have the best sanctuary on the planet. You know, to be able to have this, that way when we preachers get boring, you just sort of space out and look out there, right? But being a blessing to that world is soul nourishing even in contracting times. The interesting thing is, on the other side of the post doom door, you turn back because you're experiencing these spheres of gratitude and you look back and it still says above that door, W-A-S-F. But now, more often than not, you experience it as we are so fortunate to be alive and to be conscious 
How many other species get to feel their love of other species and grieve that and be present? How many other species get to be a blessing to other species? There's so much if we not focus on what we're losing because that, it turns out, is inevitable. We will experience contraction. That's where we are. In fact, there are four sentences, four questions, really, four questions that typify the insanity of our era, the insanity of our times. They both reveal and express the collective cluelessness, the fact that these questions can even be asked, and the fact that most people have no idea what the answers are. That's not taught in high, high schools. Everybody ought to know it. First question that reflects the insanity of our time is, does God exist? <laughs> Any God that can exist or not exist is an ecocidal understanding of the divine. You don't think, does the biosphere exist? Does the ecosphere exist? The biosphere is alive, and we're part of it. We're an expression of it. And we, need, we, neither e we either need to align our laws, our medicine, our politics, our economics, our education with the way that works, then we can move into a future. All pro-future cultures for the first 97% of human history, all sustainable cultures, as I said before, had a personal relationship to what we speak of in impersonal ways. We talk about the oceans, the earth, little e. We don't even capitalize it, like Venus, Mars, Jupiter, those are capital proper names, they're the names of gods. We say the earth, little e because it deceives us into thinking that we can just use it. That's a place for our waste. Let me say it this way. The environment doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the environment. What we call the environment is primary reality. It's everything we depend upon. It's our material creator, sustainer, and end. And if that's not divine, it, nothing is. Yet by calling primary reality the environment, Nature, little n, we deceive ourselves. It fosters anthropocentrism, human centers. We think we can get away with toxifying it. We think we can get away with having all the resources come and benefit us and screw any other species. We are self-deceived in that. So, does God exist? Crazy question. I consider the theist-atheist debate to be one of the great collective insanities of our era. You've got millions of people debating whether or not God is real or whether or not God exists when the one real God, namely reality, personified or not, we've been living out of right relationship to and we are now about to experience consequences of biblical proportion. And people are debating whether or not God exists or whether or not God is real. Any God, any notion of the divine that doesn't include what all the other species are telling us and what the climate is telling us as divine revelation, as authoritative, is a trivial, impotent, and ultimately ecocidal notion of the divine. So that's the first insane question, does God exist? The second question is, is civilization gonna collapse? There has never, we know of 115 to 120 civilizations that have become great and collapsed. Not one of them was able to sustain because anything that's unsustainable at some point won't be sustained. It means it's going to end. And we know a lot about what's the difference between pro-future cultures that are sustainable, the first 97% of human history, and anti-future cultures, cultures that are unsustainable. And it's all about, or mostly what it's about, is our relationship to primary reality. If we treat primary reality as primary, we can survive. If we measure progress and success by how well the soil is doing decade by decade, how well are the forests doing decade by decade, how well are the oceans doing decade by decade, what's the carbon in the atmosphere decade by decade, how are other species doing decade by decade, we can thrive into the future and our children can thrive. If we measure progress and well-being in how is my corporation doing, how am I doing, we're insane. Think Russian nesting dolls. That's the nature of reality. We're made up of smaller creative realities, like our microbiome that we can't exist without. We are dependent upon larger creative realities, namely our food and the trees and the plankton that supply oxygen. So to exploit the rest of the body of life for our benefit is ultimate insanity. And yet that's what happens when religion is asleep at the wheel or 
worse. That's when religion is not playing the role of ensuring accountability to the future. In fact, if you only remember one thing from this sermon, I would encourage you to remember this. Sustainable means accountable to the future. Unsustainable means unaccountable to the future. And everything else is a footnote or a distraction. And only religion can play that moral voice. So being in a post-due mind is to recognize that we are part of the universe, we're an expression of the universe, that the universe nature that we're actually dependent upon is a greater thou, not a lesser it. It's also to recognize that death is not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> death is integral to the universe, it's sacred. If there's anything holy, death is holy. Impermanence and death are necessary. For years, Connie and I did programs on a sacred science evidential approach to mortality and death, to, to impermanence and death. And so the only cultures that were able to sustain for thousands of years were those that had a sense of identity that they knew that they were part of reality, but they also had an identity with time. They had a personal relationship to the past, to the ancestors. In tribal cultures, indigenous cultures, first cultures, when you died, you didn't just end, you became an ancestor. And you honored those ancestors. And you knew that when you die, you would be honored. In the memory, in the stories. Because in sustainable cultures, they pass that information on how to live sustainably by having a personal relationship to the past. And they have a personal relationship to the future by imagining the seventh generation. How would they judge what we're doing today? There's that continuity with time and continuity with space that unsustainable cultures tend to lack because they tend to be anthropocentric. So, does God exist? Crazy. Are we, uh, our civilization gonna collapse? Of course. Are we gonna go extinct? Of course we're gonna go extinct. Now, it may not be for five million years until an asteroid or a super volcano takes us out. No mammal our size lasts more than five million years. In fact, most of them last two or three million years. But, we could go extinct in the next 100 years. If the Arctic wigs out and the blue ocean event where all this heat that was being reflected actually gets in and then the shallow seas there, the methane, I mean, things could wig out really bad, then in the next 20 years we see major, major famine all over the world because all it takes is three of the five growing regions in the world to fail in the same year and you got a billion or more people dying of starvation. Russia, Australia, Europe, Canada, and the United States, and somewhat China too, these are the major growing places. All it takes is three to fail in the same year, and because the jet stream's doing this, that's not outside the realm of possibility. So are we gonna go extinct? Of course we're gonna go extinct. And it could be within the next 50 years, or it could be in the next five million years, but it's probably gonna be in that range. And if you compress the whole history of the universe, like if you make 14 billion years equal 100 years, just to make it easier to get our heads around, at that time scale, Homo sapiens, where we speak symbolic language, well, Homo habilis, walking upright using stone tools, is the last week on a 100-year time frame. You know, if the beginning of the universe is one second after zero, uh, one second after midnight of the year zero, January 1st, and right now is December 31st of the 99th year, at midnight, just about to go into the 100th year, at that time scale, the last week is Homo habilis. Homo erectus, we domesticated fire on December 29th. We've been speaking in symbolic words December 31st. And for most of the last day, from 11 p.m. on December 30th until about 11.30 p.m. on the 31st, we live more or less sustainably. We live pro-future. And so recognizing that is to recognize that even if we go extinct in five million years, that's a half a week on a cosmic century timeline. One of the things that gives me hope is that worst case scenario, let's say we have World War III, it goes nuclear, all the nuclear bombs go off and everything else. One of the things that gives me hope is that even if that's the case, Earth will fully recover by early February on a 100 year timeline, early February of the 100th year. That's 12 to 15 million years from now. 
Earth will continue to spin. The moon will continue to do it. The Earth will go around the Milky Way. All this is species will come, species will go. See, it's not all about us. That's the interesting thing. On a hundred year timeline, when we've only been around the last day, clearly it's not all meant for us. And again, this helps us. This depressing stuff can help us shift out of human centeredness and come home to life centeredness, ecocentrism. So, does God exist? Crazy. Uh, is civilization going to collapse? Of course. Are we going to go extinct? Of course. And that may be soon, maybe far, but it's going to happen. And just like your life will improve to the degree that you don't fight your mortality and just accept that, of course, you're going to die. Uh, ten years ago, I went through a very serious bout of cancer right here. I was on Whidbey Island. I was at the Ke Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and I, went, I had a tumor the size of my fist in my spleen. And we were looking at the possibility I could die in the next eight months until the chemo worked. And I haven't lost that not taking my life for granted, but except now I also don't take my species for granted. Of course we're gonna die. And the final question is, is it too late? Is there any hope? Well, of course it's too late for some things, but it's not too late for all the things that matter. See, that's the thing. People start thinking about, like, is it too late? Is it too late to save industrialism? Of course. Is it too late to have meaningful work, to have the most important life-giving relationships of your life? No, not at all. In fact, in hard times, in contracting times, turns out that in previous civilizations, we see this over and over again, including the Great Depression. We see 80% of the best of humanity show up. And we do see 20% of the worst of humanity show up. And that's, in a, that's unavoidable. So it's not too late. It's not too late to do all kinds of activism. But we can do it from a place of fearlessness, not in order to. And the people in your life who are still in functional denial or who basically can't accept that, just keep loving them. Because even if everybody you knew and everybody I know and everybody they knew affected everybody, in fact, even if seven billion of us tonight had some epiphany and started doing the right things, still there are some climate things that are already out of our control. And so when we accept that, then we find great, meaningful, inspiring, hopeful work. People sometimes say, well, do you have hope? Of course I have hope. But hope is like liquid. Saying do you have hope is like saying do you have liquid? Some liquid will kill you. Some liquids will sustain you. What we hope in or hope for matters. My great mentor, the most important book I've ever read in my life is Overshoot by William Catton. Overshoot, the ecological basis of revolutionary change. And he has this great quote. He said, humanity is locked into stealing ravenously from the future. Human self-restraint, practiced both individually and especially collectively, is our indispensable hope. That's where our hope is. So the last thing I'll say is find the places where your joy and the world's needs intersect. Find the places where you can be a blessing to others in a way that's a blessing to you. Find a place where you can be hope for someone else because they've got it more difficult than you and they experience you as the incarnation of hope. That's what gives us joy, even in contracting times. We can't change that, but we can add joy to others. And I think that's what it's all about, in addition to planting trees, building topsoil, and anything you can do on behalf of life.